Mac Power Users, episode 590, Our Video Workflows. Hello and welcome back to Mac Power Users. My name is Stephen Hackett. I'm joined as always by my friend and yours, Mr. David Sparks. Hey, Stephen. How are you today? I am doing really well, David. How about you? You know, at WWDC is just a few weeks away, and I'm finding myself thinking about it a lot. Me <laughs> too. I, uh, I just want I want better iPad software. I want some new Mac hardware. I I want all the things, Stephen. And for me, WWDC approaching feels a little bit like Christmas approaching. It's like, what sort of things is Apple going to give us this year? That's right. Some of it we may get now. Some of it may come in the fall, depending on when you run the betas. Yeah, yeah. We all know if there's iPad stuff, you're going to cave early. Yeah, and I'm down to one iPad, so that's scary, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Oh, uh, an update on that. So my daughter, so I have two kids. One of them took my old the smaller iPad Pro and the bigger one who has a very old iPad said, dad, when she, you know how it is with kids, like she heard that I gave one to the other kid and she's like, well, I want your other old one. You know, the big one that I was going to sell back to Apple. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why I was going to buy a keyboard case. Cause I had to give her mine with the existing keyboard case. Well, w- she approached me and she said, what I'd really like is one of the smaller iPad airs. I don't want that big monster iPad that you have. And I'm yeah. like, well, you should have told me because we can sell my big monster iPad for about the same cost as a new iPad, pro, a new iPad Air. So that's fine. And and I'm like, would you want the attached keyboard? She's like, no, I have. It. She has a like a clicky Bluetooth keyboard. She's like, I want to use my keyboard. I'm like, oh, that worked out perfect. So nice. I'm uh, I'm selling the big one and buying an iPad Air for her, and I'm keeping my old keyboard, which I can use with my new white iPad. So it's all going to work out. The Air is great. Mary has one. It's fantastic. Yeah. That was a little bit of a a side story there. Sorry. That's okay. I just, I knew Steven was going to be upset about my white keyboard, and uh, which has showed up. I returned it, slapped a label on it, sent it back without ever opening it. Yeah. I just can't see them (laughs) being easy to keep clean. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, WWC is not too far away, and I'm excited about that. I'm I'm super pumped. We will be talking much more about that, of course, as we get there. So uh, stay tuned for all of that that fun stuff. On more power users this week, uh, I have some impressions of the M1 iMac, the new 24 inch. So looking forward to uh, to sharing those. I've been spending some time with it. It finally got here after a, a very long winding trip with FedEx, but just a teaser. It's it's pretty awesome. The Orange Beauty. Do you have a name for it? No, because if I name it, then I want to keep it. Right? Can't can't yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that in more power users today. I guess one other bit of new Apple gear. Let's just take a minute to talk about before we get into the meat of today's show. New Apple TV remote. I feel like as a public service, I need to tell the listeners. If you are among the many that does not like the Apple TV remote and you have $60 burning a hole in your pocket, this is an excellent use for it. It's really, really good. We we got ours and I just, I took the Siri remote, just, I took it away. It's out here in my office. It'll go in a box somewhere. It's, it really is great. The thing that has surprised me the most, um, see what you think about this. It has the most delightfully clicky buttons I've ever felt on a remote. Yeah, I feel like they've kind of nailed that down now. The thing I like about it the most is a dedicated power and dedicated mute button. Mm -hmm. Because teaching my kids, because I have the, we use Apple TV as our primary interface. And um, it's, it's input one on our TV. And it took me a while to teach them how to turn it off. Because my TV can turn off and on based on the Apple TV. It's got that that chip in it or whatever they've got. And and these aren't brand new TVs. I think most people have that disability, but in the old system, you had to like go to a menu and press a button. Now you just press the power button on the remote and it turns off. Mm -hmm. So, and then a mute button on a TV remote, go figure. I mean, I could never figure out why they never did that on the last version, but it's very nice being able to mute it when a phone call comes in or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. And you can use it with your existing Apple TV. And you basically just pair it and you're you're off 
and running with it. It, yeah. it is so much better. It's really infuriating how long we were stuck with the bad one. Yeah, I uh, I liked it, and I'm going to buy a second one for the bedroom TV because I was in TV in bed last night watching TV with Daisy, and I'm like, I am never. It's like the new remote has ruined me, and next month's fun money is going to buy a second remote. There you go. So in a t- in addition to watching TV, my wife and I have started this this project where we're going to Disneyland and making videos. And I think it's just something, you know, when your kids get older, both of my kids are in college now. And as things clear up with COVID, they're going to be, you know, out of the house. So we wanted to do something together. We have all these friends that got divorced, you know, when their kids went away. <laughs> and we like, you know, one of the things we want to do is find projects we can do together. And this was would be a fun one. But I am suddenly finding myself um, working on video workflows, like I'm shooting 4K, using Final Cut, looking at different cameras. I've learned a lot in the last couple of months that we've been experimenting with this. I know you know even more. And I thought it would be fun to do a show talking through video workflows, kind of beyond just the basic iPhone plus iMovie workflow, and uh, and share with the the audience some of the stuff we know and have learned and honestly, um, demystify this because I feel like a lot of people in the audience that are intimidated by something like Final Cut should absolutely not be. Mm-hmm. Now that I've used it a little bit, I realize that this is way easier than I thought it would be. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about uh, about Final Cut when we get there. For that that reason, it is <laughs> it's sort of amazing that it and Logic are talked about as if they're siblings because uh, Logic is intimidating, <laughs> even as someone yeah. who uses it several times a week but final cuts fantastic yeah so let's talk through our video workflows um you make a lot of youtube videos you want to talk through that process a little bit yeah yeah i I would and this is something that when the pandemic came around i had to really focus on like the core parts of our business and so the youtube channel got put on pause but uh, as this episode goes up, there is one new video and a second one coming right behind it. So I'm, I'm sort of back in the saddle now after a year, which feels great. Yeah. For me, and maybe it's maybe it's my background is like, before any of this, I was a writer, is that I start with the script. I start with what I want to say in a video. And for me, like picking the topic, because I don't normally do on the 512 Pixels YouTube channel, I don't normally do like news or reaction to news. It's mostly like, you know, little eight to 10 minute mini documentaries on this one computer, right? It's pretty, basically pretty much that. And I've branched out some and I I continue to branch out, but that's sort of the heart of it. And so I start by thinking about the things that I want to get across about the topic. And for, for whatever reason, when I like sit down to write you know, a piece on 512 pixels about something. I don't outline. I was sort of like the kid in school where like, you know, you're supposed to show your work, you're supposed to show your outline and like turn it in with the paper. I would write the paper and then like backfill the outline because I just don't, it doesn't work for me writing for whatever reason. I I don't know why. Sure. But in YouTube land doing video, I do start with an outline. So I start with, well, you know, why am I talking about this computer? What are the couple of specs I want to talk about? And I start matching those words with the shots or the things that I want to have on screen, whether it be, okay, well, this is going to be me talking to camera, or this is going to be B-roll of you know, this laptop opening as I talk about the hinge, or, you know, me trying to plug in a USB-A port and getting frustrated, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And I sort of build it up from an outline and eventually becomes a script with short paragraphs and it sort of evolves from there. Yeah, I I think that makes sense. I, I'm doing two different types of, of video, the YouTube related video. The Max Sparky stuff is usually me, you know, in my studio. And that is one workflow. Like I don't really script those out, but I outline everything. And I just kind of speak extemporaneously with the outline in front of me. I find that when I script, I just don't sound natural. It's Mm -hmm. hard for me to read the script naturally. 
but I do that. And then the stuff we do at Disneyland is very much just run and gun and just like, okay, say what's on your mind now, you know? Yeah. I mean, the last one we put up, Daisy was talking about how she gets a powdered sugar on her feet when she eats beignets. I mean, that's not something you <laughs> script, you know? Yeah. But so, you know, that the, the prep I think does matter, however. Yeah. And, and it depends on what the, the content is, right? If I'm talking about a power book from 2002, like I have to write that because I can't keep those specs in my head and explain them clearly enough. Like I need to have them in front of me and, and we'll talk about how I actually have them in front of me when I, when I'm talking, but I totally get it. And I think that's one reason. And, and we'll get to this a little bit later is why I've taken to Twitch for some video stuff for that sort of more off the cuff things you just discuss as it happens. Yeah. And you produce a lot more in Vital Pixels than I do as Max Barkey. Like a recent one I've done was several months ago about um, personal retreats. And I'll put a link to the show note. And you can, like, if you want to, when we talk about our camera setups and how we're running it, that's a good example of me doing that. And that was all extemporaneous. That was not scripted, mm -hmm. that video. Um, one thing I do plan on doing more of is I'm adding some little animations or cartoons to them. So you don't have to look at my face all the time. I don't want to be like a hostage video. <laughs> and you do that with a lot of B-roll. But when I'm talking about personal retreats, you know, a shot of a Apple hinge isn't going to work. You know, so you got to do well, something else. It depends on what kind of retreat you're taking, David. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Although I will say that I like this whole process. And as I get more comfortable with Final Cut and some of the tools, and as my house empties out, and it's, you know, my studio is right in the middle of our house right now. So it's it's a constant, you know, beehive. And But as people start going off to school and work, I think I will be able to shoot a lot more of that and, and produce a lot more as Max Barkey as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's one reason I'm in the middle of expanding my studio space is to have dedicated space for videos. Like as we're recording this, I'm working on the video that's been out for a few days as it comes out. Time is very confusing. And like I have two iMacs set up on a table, like in the middle of my tiny office. And it's like, I have to like walk yeah. around them to go do anything. And so I'm looking forward to having some more space. That's a little bit more. I can just walk in and start making something. Cause right now it's like set it up and tear it down every time. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the recording process. And for me, I'm going to split it up because I have, recording the Max Barkey videos, which is done in studio and under kind of a, a place I have a lot more control over versus the Disneyland field guide videos, which are literally shot, you know, running around Disneyland. Mm -hmm. Start with the, so what do you, cause I know you have like dedicated stations, like you have an overhead cam yeah. set up and you've got like, what, how is, I, I can't really visualize it. Yeah. So, uh, I guess we'll start with the overhead table. This is something that I built a couple of years ago with my dad, and I will have a video. It's an older studio tour on my channel, but it shows the overhead table and how it works. So uh, you can kind of see it, but basically it means that I can, I can mount a camera looking straight down at a, at a, the top of a desk. In this case, it's a table that I bought from Ikea and then drilled a bunch of holes in to build this. Yeah. And it's just, it's all built out of lumber and some steel piping. And so I can move the camera to the front of the desk, to the back of the desk. I can move it left to right and I can move it up and down by sliding these components of, of two by. So it's kind of like a sled. And then I have really heavy duty clamps to hold everything down. Like where I have, when I have the camera where I want it. In reality, I probably could have done without the adjustability because basically I just always leave it in the same place. But it is nice to get it out of the way if I need to use that desk somewhere else. You can do this sort of thing with C stands or like you can get a tripod head that like swivels over 90 degrees. You can do overhead a, a few different ways, but I wanted a way where I could have really consistent overhead shots of products. So if I'm unboxing something, or I'm on Twitch building something out of Lego, whatever it is, I can have a really nice shot that's from above, straight flat on the desk that looks really good. And I have it lit really evenly. And it was a bit of a, 
a challenge to figure out how to build it and make it work. But in reality, it's been such a huge addition to what I do. I absolutely love it. Yeah. So a common theme with my little studio is it's, uh, you know, it's the fancy room, you know, the room when you walk in most houses where people have a sofa and when guests come, they get the intimates out, right. You know, Mm -hmm. the whole, the whole thing. Uh, Well, I turn that into my studio. And so it's not a room that I can have like a big camera rig just sitting out all at 24 hours. And I definitely don't have room in that place for an overhead rig like you have. But instead, and I'm putting a, a link in the in the show notes now. The um, I bought an overhead because I'm making a field guide, and I guess that's something I should have shared. I, I've got a future field guide that has a lot more video of me and a lot more video of overhead and stuff like that. I'll tell you the title later, but it's probably going to be the new year before that one releases. Um, but so I've been shooting all this stuff, but I wanted a way to do it, so I bought a thing. It was a couple hundred bucks at B and H, and it's like a metal rig that just kind of clamps and bolts together that you can hang an slr off of or an iphone off of and i have a table i can set up and just put this over the top of it and it shoots great top down but i guess the, the common thread of my studio is everything has to be broken down and put together i don't have everything just sitting there the way you do which i think kind of gets in the way of actually making video but you know it is what it is yeah yeah, this is a a great alternative to building something like I built. And it looks really like sturdy and heavy. So I guess if you put yeah. uh, a heavy camera on it and you're using the desk, like does it move any or is it no, pretty stable? No, it doesn't. And if you have a desk that has a lip to the top, you can clamp the pieces down so it doesn't move at all. I, the, I put it on, you know, I've got this thing in my studio and it's it's on my website too in the studio tour. The I call it we call it the Iron Giant, but it's it's like a, a tool chest with a wood top from Home Depot, and it's got wheels on it. And I keep it in my studio. and And getting that from upstairs to downstairs, by the way, when I had to move the studio with the pandemic, that was harrowing. I bet. <laughs> I thought, I'm like, am I going to stand behind this thing? Or we, <laughs> anyway, uh, but but I put it on top of that, and it doesn't have any lip, so I use gaff tape, and I okay. just gaff tape everything down really tight when I set it up, and then once I hang the camera in it, it's not going anywhere, and it works fine. And that room has a ton of light, so it, it's awesome. I so what I need to do for for video shoot up in my studio is have a lot of stuff that's mobile gear. Like I. When I shoot video, I have a, a normal tripod um, that I put the camera on. It's it's not like one on wheels or a dolly system or anything. It's just a tripod that I keep in a drawer. And when it's time to shoot video, I pull it out and I put the camera on the tripod. I've got a ring light at, that I put on a stand and a reflector. It just it takes me about 15 minutes to set everything up. And that was one of the things I needed to do was time myself to remind myself that in the time that I often spend just goofing around watching one YouTube video, I can be set up to shoot YouTube video. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I get it. And it, it is with like the ring light in particular, those have been very popular during the pandemic because a lot of people have needed something like this. And if, if you're not familiar with this, it's basically a, basically a donut that lights up. They have various sizes. Uh, I, uh, like 18 inch or 16 inch, 12 inches, different sizes, depending on what you need. And it, it gives you even lighting and the camera pokes through it. And so you have even lighting on you or your subject and it, it really works well. I mean, I have one of these. I also have a I mean, multiple light kit, but if you just need like one thing to get started, a ring light is the way to go. Yeah. And you can see it in my pupils. <laughs> you yeah. Know, if you look. What are you going to do? It kind of makes a funny effect there, but like it, it is what it is. You know, same thing. I used to really worry about, oh, what if you see glass, you know, light refracted in my glasses if I turn my head? It's like, you know what? I just wear glasses. This is how this is. Uh, I've yeah. learned to let go of some of that stuff. What do you do? Uh, is What camera do you shoot on when you shoot your video? Yeah. So I have the Sony a7 III, which I think is what you have too, isn't it? Yeah. And it's it's great. The Sony A line, I've been a fan of for a long time. I had the 
A7R2 before this. The A7 III is a little bit older now, but it, it definitely does what I need it to do. The only thing I wish it did was high frame rate and 4K. So if I shoot high frame rate, then to slow it down to make really smooth motion, uh, it only does it in 1080. So I borrow, uh, like, <laughs> my brother has the a newer version that can do, can do what I want. So I borrow his for slow-mo stuff. And I have mounted on it almost all the time is Sony's 24 to 70 f2.8 lens. Now, some people will say, oh, you know, you need a, you got to have a fixed lens. You know, you need something that's not zoom. Look, the 24 to 70 is fantastic for my needs. It's fantastic for the the amount of space I have uh, in such a small room. You know, I can, I can back it up and be really wide at 24 millimeters or I can punch in and I would say that like 98% of the stuff on my YouTube channel that's not shot just on an iPhone, like a, like an iPhone vlog, which I've done a few of, it's through this lens. Yeah, I got myself um, an expensive lens for this camera. I got a 24 millimeter fixed lens with a, I think it's a 1.4 f-stop. And it is like my baby. Mm-hmm. It's such a great lens because... With that lower f-stop, it allows me to blur the background, which I think looks really nice in the studio. If you look at that um, um, personal retreat video, I had the f-stop down pretty far for that one, and that gives you an example of what I can do with that lens. Yeah. The other reason I like that lens is because I use it, I have a little like cage rig I put on the A7, and then I use the Rode, um, what is it called? The, it, my Rode microphone. I think it's the same one you have. Uh, the Rode Video Mic Pro shotgun, but I mount it on as you're looking at the camera on the right side of the camera, offset by about 12 inches. So what I do is I sit right in front of the the microphone and talk straight into that shotgun mic, mm-hmm. and then the lens is just a little bit off to my left, and I look to my left. But then that 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 allows me to kind of put myself on the right side of the frame or the left side, depending on how you look at it, and then leave space so I'm not totally centered and I can like put other assets if I want behind me. Yeah. And I I get really good audio that way because I'm with that 24 millimeter lens, I can get pretty close to it. Yeah. And, um, and so that's kind of my, that's like my big thing, you know, having everything there, being able to get capture pretty good audio. Uh, the, the, the room I, I record in, has amazing light. It's got skylights around it. So it's like there's tons of light from every direction if I shoot at the right time of day. Um, but it also has bad audio because it's got a high ceiling. So uh, being close to that microphone kind of helps offset that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've used the the Rode VideoMic Pro. Uh, I still have it, but I switched over to the Rode Wireless Go. So it is a, a wireless pack. So you have a component on your camera running audio into your camera and you have this little box that you can use on its own, like clip it to a shirt and it is a wireless lav, or you can actually run a wireless lav, which is what I do because it looks nicer. And that has really been key for me. I've struggled with audio in my videos for a long time. Part of it is this, this room is great for podcasting, but it's because I sit in a corner that's completely surrounded by foam and out like in the room there's it's just not quite as as good and if you're back from the camera a little bit you know it really makes a difference and so with this lav i've been able to to basically just set it up and and forget it because wherever i am in relation to the camera i'm going to sound the same uh it's also what i use on my twitch streams if you've seen those and it's uh you know something else to charge which is a little bit annoying so basically like if i know i'm going to shoot a video the night before making sure the Sony batteries are charged, now making sure these microphone and its receiver is charged, but it's worked out really well for me. I I think I'm going to have to look into this because they came out with a new version that has two microphones. Yes. And for the Disney stuff we do, it'd be nice if we were both on a mic. I've got a whole bunch of camera questions for you about that part of my life, but let's, (laughs) let's get through the studio stuff first. I guess one thing that that I do that you don't do is I do a little bit of teleprompter work. Sure. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the videos I do that are very tech heavy, it's just very helpful to have the script there. And it, it is easy to sound robotic and like you're reading. And I'm not I'm not saying I'm any expert at it by any means. But the way that I do it is I have an iPad mini that runs an application called Prompt Smart Pro. There's a bunch of teleprompter apps on the App Store. This one was suggested to me by our friend Quinn Nelson because it is uh, really, really flexible. So you can, and it works pretty well. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. You can just have it uh, be speech recognized. So it just moves the text as you say it out loud, but you can also control it like with an iPhone, you know, off camera somewhere. And it's, uh, it's worked really well for me. It, you know, it takes some practice. This takes practice, but it, it gets the job done. And the reason I chose an iPad mini and the reason that when I do it, I make the text as large as possible is so you don't see my eyes going right to left a bunch because I don't want to look like I'm reading. Right. Sure. And, and again, that was, um, that was advice from Quinn was like, blow the text up as big as it gets, put it on the smallest iPad you have. And that will really help in terms of the, your sort of bouncing eyes <laughs> in your video. Yeah. I mean, just the whole idea is just, just remember to keep your eyes on that lens, you know, yes. point, point at the glass. The other thing that I, I, found very quickly I need to do is just remember to smile at the camera for a second or two before I start talking and smile for a second or two after I stop talking because it's very easy to be so glad you're done to like immediately turn your head and then it's very hard at the end to, to make that work mm -hmm. yeah always leave some room for editing <laughs> yeah the, the other thing I did once I figured out like okay I've got this camera and I'm gonna try and use this mic although now you have me super curious about trying to love is I set up angles in the studio that I can shoot. So like I've got the one with the computer behind me. I've got the one with the computer to the side of me. I've got the one with the writing desk behind me. Um, we just hung a bunch of artwork in that room. Now I can, I've got an angle there. I've got an angle across the desk. So I could be sitting and looking at my monitor and look to my right and see the camera. So I'm definitely getting better at like finding those angles. And with my pretty mobile setup it's easy enough to to adjust for it yeah that's cool uh for, for me i don't have anything fixed but my idea was anything in the studio except for my desk basically could be a background and so sometimes i'm in front of the collection sometimes i'm in front of the the foam on the other wall sometimes i'm in front of the bookshelf just kind of depends on what i feel like that day and to try to rotate it you know if i've done a couple of videos yeah. where i'm in front of the collection trying to change it up a little bit because it's the central room in our house, like if behind me as I'm sitting at the computer is a staircase going upstairs. And <laughs> right, I, yeah. That's yeah. the angle I don't really want sure. ever. In. And so I actually have a screen that I bought for the old studio. It's just like one of those Japanese like rice paper screens. And it folds up. It's in the corner. And, and I use it also for Zoom calls. And like we, we all use it when we want to have like – something where we're looking in the computer and we just don't want to have the background show mm -hmm. up. So I use that for some shots too. It just kind of depends on what I need, but, but I, I really feel um, moving from, cause I had my own studio in the house, which was a bedroom that was great because it was isolated. I can go in there any hour and record screencasts and do anything I want. And moving to the central room of the house, which I had to do because of the pandemic that that was a downside because it's harder for me to record because it's got to be at the hour when nobody is wandering around making noise and banging pots. But there's a lot of this new space I really like. I like being central in the house. I like the light of the, the room has great light. The acoustics aren't as good, but it's really kind of caused me to rethink a whole bunch of ways I do setups. And I think when all of this is over, I'm probably just going to stay in that space. I'm going to leave the kids' rooms for the kids. That's interesting. I kind of figured you'd you'd go back, but if it's working for you, and it'll be quieter when people are out yeah. of the house again, so you, you kind of get yeah. rid of the downside that you have now. Yeah, I I went through a whole bunch like the because of the audio in the room and just the being in the middle of everything. There are some days, trust me, that I really don't like having things going around on around me while I'm working, but 
you put those AirPods Pro on and you put turn on noise canceling and it, you do kind of isolate yourself that way. But I even considered at one point building one of those studio sheds in the backyard. I mean, I could do that. I My dad was in construction. I feel like I could probably put something together. But then I realized, no, um, once everybody goes back to school and work, this house is going to be empty again. It's going to be me and the dog all day. So why spend all that money? Um, to do something like that. And so I'm pretty happy with the situation. And now I figure out the camera angles. I haven't nailed audio yet, but like one of the reasons I did the show was to to pick your brain. And I think that's (laughs) one thing I want to look into. So I'm generally happy with the way everything gets shot in studio. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Text Expander from Smile. Get 20% off. Just go to textexpander.com slash podcast and type more with less effort. With Text Expander, you can supercharge your team, allowing them to do more with the same resources. With Text Expander, your team will have less repetition, fewer errors, and greater consistency, which makes them feel like they've hopped off a bicycle and into a Ferrari. You can keep your team consistent, accurate, and current by sharing your text and images with the whole staff to keep them on track. Everyone will share the same messages and give the same answers to all customer questions. We talk about that often in relation to customer support, but I had an email recently from a listener who's a lawyer, and he has his whole staff using Text Expander. So when they get emails from potential clients or opposing counsel, they've got a set script of text responses that they manage through Text Expander. And that's what the magic of Text Expander for Teams is. Everybody can share the same pool. You can make changes, and everybody just gets it. So work faster and smarter with Text Expander. You can use Text Expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations to streamline and speed up everything you type. You can create powerful snippets to save you time that all you do is type a short abbreviation and Text Expander does the rest for you. It even does scripting and Apple Script and very complicated text expansion that's not possible with any other text expansion platform. You can keep your whole team communicating efficiently and consistently with the same language and share your snippets of messaging, signatures, descriptions, with everyone who works on the projects with you. Best of all, it's available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. And if you're listening to this right now, you get 20% off your first year. Just go to textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. I subscribe myself for me and my, my virtual assistant, so we've got a little team that uses all these features. You should too. Once again, that URL is textexpander.com slash podcast and let them know you heard about it at the Mac Power Users. Now, so you're doing Twitch stuff, and I'm doing Disneyland stuff, which is a totally different way to capture capture video. You want to talk through that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So for my, my Twitch stuff really started with the St. Jude fundraiser we did last year because Mike was going to be remote, and then we had to... We didn't have to, but we decided to do more video stuff leading up to it. And so kind of got into the world of Twitch in a way that I haven't uh, before. And, and honestly, I still feel a little bit like a imposter on Twitch because Twitch has this whole like community thing. Like it has its own personality as a site that I don't like, I just don't care about a lot of the stuff that you can do that you can do on Twitch. But uh, but it is a really good platform for live video live streamed video and so to do this uh i ended up building a pc for it there are tools on the mac to do video streaming like this but in reality windows is better suited for it especially if you're doing window capture like i need to capture everything happening in this chrome tab or in this game it is uh it's way more robust on windows and so i'm using uh this this custom pc that i built Though that in itself was a lot of fun. I'd never built a PC before. So I did all this research for weeks and weeks and weeks and talked to people and you know, like all of my tech YouTuber friends, like, hey, I'm thinking about this and that. What do you think? And over the course of about a month, got the parts in um and uh and put it together. And one of the keys to it was having multiple HDMI capture cards. And so these are PCI cards that have HDMI ports on them, but you run video into the computer with them. And uh, and so I've got a couple of those. They capture in 4K, and I can bring video 
in from a camera into the PC, set up scenes in Streamlabs, which is the software I use, and then send it out to Twitch. Yeah, I mean, that's like a thing. And you've got a Twitch tab on your channel where folks can go and watch some of the old streams, which uh, I've been doing as we've been prepping for today's show. And it seems like you've kind of, you're pretty comfortable on camera and you've got a pretty good setup for this. Yeah, I've, I didn't realize this in the beginning, but it taps into my love of doing live shows where we like take Mac power users on the road and, you know, go do it in a theater somewhere. Yeah. We're going to do that again, by the oh, way. Oh yeah. That's going to happen. We, we got to, but it's, it's sort of the same vibe and energy and I didn't really expect that, but I've sort of fallen into it. I, I am pretty comfortable there. For me, the idea was I'm going to build this to be able to sit down, hit a few buttons, and be streaming. And so it's built at the overhead rig. I have an overhead camera and a camera that faces me. And I have a third camera that I can use if I'm somewhere else and need to show something else, either handheld or on a tripod elsewhere. But they're all yeah. running over HDMI right into the PC. And Streamlabs, if you haven't used software like this, these tools let you bring in different video sources, different audio sources. So I can bring in my microphone or I can bring in music or if I'm playing a video on the stream itself, I could say, hey, pull this audio from QuickTime and the video and route it out to the to the stream. And it's really easy. You can save scenes. And so, of course, I have a stream deck over there to change between scenes. And yeah. it's really really a lot easier than I thought it would have been to sort of build up your little collection of, of different shots and different streams. And then to switch between them really easily is literally the push of a button. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you're doing Lego builds and uh, yeah. technical stuff. And I don't know. It looks really good to me. Thank honestly. you. Yeah. It's, it has been a lot of fun and it's been, uh, it's been one of those things where it's not really work at the moment. It is. I mean, I'm doing things like I do at work, like looking at old computers or just talking about tech or whatever. But for me, it is purely in the hobby and interest section so far. Like the channel on Twitch isn't monetized yet. And that's okay with me because it's, I'm just doing it for fun at this point. And it has slowly grown and it's been, it's been a really different sort of category to play in. Yeah, and that's exactly what the Disney thing is for me. I, I just wanted to do something different. I'm a nerd. I wanted to play with the technology around it. But I also feel like I have a lot to share. Uh, Daisy and I had, had started co-writing a book, a field guide, and then we decided that this would be way better with video. So we're just going to make it one tiny bit at a time. You know, we just we did one when it reopened. We did one on May the 4th. We've been doing some screencasts on the app. You know, we did one on recently on downtown Disney and we're going to make these little videos. And as long as we keep making them, the, the thing will co continually evolve, but it totally changes the video capture game for me. And like one of my challenges for this, this project. And one of the reasons I want to talk to you about it and, and the listeners is trying to figure out what makes more sense in terms of capturing video. Like I have the first generation Osmo pocket, mm -hmm. which is this great little like, um, camera it's a gimbal off of a drone basically attached to a little stick so you can carry it around and it's got a gimbal on it and it shoots decent video you know but it's a very small sensor too it's not a very big sensor yeah i've got an iphone that takes great video and i've got my fancy camera and super expensive lens and so the first video we did the reopening i did with the with the osmo pocket which was perfectly fine video. It was very stable and you can just pull it out of your pocket and start shooting with it. But it's also limited and you know, the 4k footage out of it is not super great. It's pretty grainy with that small thing. And you know, I'm just not sure I'm really happy with that. Whereas I bring the Sony camera and that's what I used for the star Wars day. And that's what I used for the one we did in downtown Disney and it's super creamy bokeh, you know, the background blurry thing when you're talking to the camera really makes it easier and more pleasant video. Mm -hmm. But it is a massive camera. Like it, that's heavy to carry it around all day. And I'm super panicked that I'm going to like drop it as I'm pulling it out of a bag. I mean, this is, 
this camera is like a significant investment for me. I've never spent that much money on a lens or a camera. And the idea of carrying it around Disneyland every time I go is pretty scary to me. <laughs> like, yeah. I feel like it's only a question of time before I break this lens and I just see you watch a grown man weep at Disneyland, you know? So I'm not sure what to do with cameras. And uh, I've been looking and doing research. There are like middle of the road cameras, like, um, and this one that has my eye is this Sony VZ100, mm-hmm. I think it's called which happens to be the camera you use for your Twitch rig. Tell me about that. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got a couple of them. And so if you're familiar with the Sony RX100 line, it's a compact camera, but it has a one-inch sensor. So you mentioned the Osmo Pocket. Most of the time, a small camera has a small sensor. That means it can be noisy and low light. It can mean that you don't necessarily get that sort of rich depth of field that you want. Even at low apertures, it's sort of limited in that range. Yeah. The RX100 was so revolutionary because it crammed a one-inch sensor in a camera that you can basically fit in a cargo pocket. Like, it's not going to fit in a jeans pocket probably, but it's pocketable, just about. Yeah. And it was really a game changer for a lot of people, including me. I've had had several RX100s over the years, but it had some limitations in terms of what it could do for this sort of vlogging-style type video uh one yeah. and the the biggest one is that it did not have a microphone input it had its own mic built in but didn't have a jack to plug in an external microphone and so if you wanted to use a lav mic or a shotgun mic you were recording to something else and then syncing it together while editing which is not difficult to do but it's another step and it's more expense and another piece of equipment yeah. and so with the zv1 so when you took the RX100, they put it in a plastic body, uh, so it's a little bit cheaper and a lot lighter, put a microphone jack in it, made the camera, excuse me, made the, the touch screen on the back be able to flip out so you can see yourself if you're filming. Which I can't do, by the way, with my big rig. Which so you it's can't like do. I just kind of wing it. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, the Sony a7 III just sort of tilts. It doesn't come out. And it is... You know, it's a small screen, but it's enough to make sure you're not chopping off your head in the shot, right? (laughs) That you're all in frame. And they added a feature that uh, you you go in and turn it on, but it's super fast autofocus. So like if you're talking and you hold up a product in front of the camera, it instantly focuses on that. And you bring your hand down and it instantly focuses back on your eyes. It uses eye tracking for focus. I already experienced that using the the A7 III. It's like I called it the churro problem. I wanted to show a churro to the camera, and I could not get it to focus yeah. on it. The ZV-1 yeah. would hit it spot on, I think. It is yeah. really impressive for its size. It's about seven, 800 bucks, depending if you find it on sale somewhere. So it's not cheap for a camera of its size. But for its capability, I've been super impressed with what it can pack into its small frame. Have you experimented with like kind of the bokeh feet? It has some sort of feature where it can kind of increase the blurriness of the background, which I think really does improve the look of the videos. Yeah, uh, I have a little bit um, and it it does a nice job at that. I don't leave that on. Um, yeah. But in the studio, I'm, it's, I'm probably shooting at like 2.8. You know, it'll yeah. go down to um, F1.8 and it's 24 to 70 millimeter equivalent. So it's it's got a nice range on it as far as zoom. Shoots 4K 30. It has HDMI out. So I'm running these cameras into my capture cards. And I'm not using the microphones on them because I'm using the LAV. But if I shoot something vlog style, I can wear a LAV and just take this camera with me. And it's I, am I can't curious. find a bad thing to say about it. Now, I, I can't speak much about the battery life because... When I'm streaming, I have them plugged into external power, but I would imagine for what you're doing, the battery life would be fine. Even if it's not, the batteries are pretty lightweight, so you could just have a second one in your pocket. Yeah, so I've been researching it because I am thinking about it. Father's Day isn't far away, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The the battery shooting video is like one hour in the battery. Okay. Which isn't great, but on Amazon, you can get three batteries for 20 bucks. So. That's that's probably not a um, 
Game Jam. The main thing for me is I just want to be able to get a little bit of that creamy background as we're walking around Disneyland. And if I can do that without having to carry my precious camera, <laughs> yeah. that I am really afraid something will happen. Like, you know, just the other day when we were at Disneyland, I, I was using one of those peak design bags with the side thing, you know, the side pocket. Mm-hmm. And I had the camera on my neck and I picked up the bag to go to the next thing we were doing. And I had forgot to zip it up and my water bottle just went flying. And I was thinking, what if my camera had been in the bag when I did that? Bad, you know. bad, bad, bad time. <laughs> <laughs> if I destroyed a seven hundred dollar camera, I would, I would feel bad. If I destroyed like a Sony A seven three and my twenty four millimeter lens, I would honestly need therapy. That's a much more <laughs> expensive accident. Uh, yeah, and with this, you wouldn't even need to carry it in a backpack, even right? You could just have it. Yeah, that's true. And and, and that's the other problem is like the stabilization isn't great. You can't see the framing, like a couple of the shots, if you look at our videos. And we don't have that many videos up yet. We're kind of new with this. But there's a couple where my head is just chopped off because I didn't know it was being chopped off, you know. And um, the stabilization isn't that great. And um, so I feel like being able to see, you know, what I'm shooting and... And and I don't I can only have a twenty four millimeter because I don't have enough money to buy like a bunch more lenses for it, and so this one actually ha- does have a zoom, so I could zoom in on some things. Yeah, well, you're you're selling me on this camera for that. It's just so much lighter. Oh yeah, <laughs> I hate carrying my Sony A seven three around. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I feel like what a whiner. Like I remember when I used to work at Design, people were walking around with that big rig on their shoulder. You oh, know? Yeah. <laughs> You know, they were like Steven Spielberg, you know, walking around Disneyland with this yep. video. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at a picture of you and Daisy right now, and you're wearing your vest. It'd go in that vest pocket, and no, and you would never even know. Yeah, that is almost enough reason there to to go with it, honestly. Yeah, I think you should give it a shot. It's it's quite an impressive little piece of tech. All right, so, um, so now that you've spent more of my money... Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, what the other things I do when I, when we shoot at Disney is I, I keep a little tripod. I don't carry a big, tall tripod. You can bring those in Disneyland, but you cannot bring in selfie sticks, but I have a small tripod that I carry in and I can put it on a trash can or a table or whatever, you know, Austin man gave us that trick. And there's a lot of video we shoot like with that stuff, you know, just use a minimal tripod. And I've been using that shotgun microphone, but if I do try one of these lavalier um, wireless ones, I would buy the one that has two mics on it because they make a version that has two remote packs. Mm -hmm. And then Daisy and I could both be wearing mics and then I wouldn't have to worry about audio. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just turn them all on. They all stay synced and you're just set. And it's it's great because then Final Cut is just embedded in the clip. The other thing I always make sure to do when we're at Disney and we're doing the stuff for the YouTube is I shoot plenty of B-roll. And thus far, I've been doing it with the big camera, and I just hold it really close to my body and spin really slow. And then there's some tricks we'll talk about in Final Cut that can help fix that. And um, the other thing I do is I take a lot of pictures, and that's another thing I use as a trick in Final Cut because you can take pictures and add some motion to them in Final Cut. Um, I guess this, uh, this little Sony camera takes good pictures too. It does. Yeah. It, it is not on par with the a seven three just cause the lens and the, everything is so much sure. smaller, yeah. but for purposes of panning in final cut, it'd be more than good enough. It, and it'd be way better than yeah. just using your phone camera for sure. Yeah. And so the current rig is quite heavy. But, you know, it sounds like I'm kind of in a transition. I would like to get it down to something that is much more pocketable. And that way I don't have to carry my big bag with me all day, which does get kind of, um, kind of heavy, you know, when you, when you're walking to, cause I usually do like 20,000 steps when I go to Disneyland, like we never take the tram. We always walk. We always, you know, we're like, let's get exercise. We're here. And, uh, by the end of the day, I've done quite a few miles. This episode of Mac power users is brought to you by our friends over at memberful. Memberful is the easiest way to sell memberships to your audience, used by the biggest creators on the web. Generate sustainable, recurring income while diversifying your revenue stream. At Relay FM, we've been using Memberful for years, and it's been a great tool. They are a great partner for our membership program. It's no secret that 2020 was a sketchy time to be a small business, 
due to the pandemic. And we really leaned into our membership and Memberful gave us all the tools we needed along the way. We now have a proven solution that works for our membership. We can quickly launch new features, add new memberships for new shows, and it leaves us in control and ownership of everything that relates to the audience, our brand, and our membership program. It has everything needed to run one of these programs, including optimized checkout, Apple Pay, easy member management, dashboard analytics, free trials, gift subscriptions, and more. And Memberful seamlessly integrates with tools you're already using, including WordPress, MailChimp, Discord, and more. Even if you're like us and you have a custom content management system, you can use Memberful. Their tools really are great. So get started for free at memberful.com. There's no credit card required. That's memberful.com. Go check it out and see what it can do for your business and your projects. Our thanks to Memberful for their support of this show and Relay FM. Okay, so we collect all this video, whether we're in studio or remote, and I wanted to spend some time talking about production. I was intimidated when a few months ago when we first started this project. I'm like, well, I'm really good at ScreenFlow and I can do almost anything in that app. Most of the video that I've done for Max Sparky thus far has been in ScreenFlow. Like even that um, weekend retreat video, I processed that in ScreenFlow <laughs> under their nice. 4K workflow. But I thought, you know, if I'm going to do actual video, I need to like use Final Cut. So I went ahead and bought it. And I'll tell you, I have had a great experience learning Final Cut the last few months. It, this is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know, Final Cut's history is so interesting. It started as this big pro, huge work system, and then they cut it down and, and then have added basically all those features back in a new way. And for me, it's been it's been years since I learned it, but it's so it is so easy to use. And, and now, by the way, Apple offers a free trial, so if you want to check it out, you're not on the hook for the hundred and fifty bucks or whatever it is, hundred bucks. And it's it is really Apple's like sort of best ease of use, but you can still make it as complex as you need it to. Like that, I think is like it's something we do in the show, right? Start simple and work our way up as we go. The best Apple software is that way, and Final Cut may be the best example of it. Like, if you just want to drag some clips in and have some transitions and maybe have a title or two and export it, super easy. But you yeah. can also do color correction and multi cam. So you can have, like, if the videos I've done, maybe people have seen them where I'm blindfolded. My wife Mary has like a bunch of iPods or a bunch of laptops, and I have to identify them by feeling. We shoot that actually on two cameras and then I edit in Final Cut by moving back and forth between the cameras, depending on what's going on. And you can just set that up in Final Cut in a way where basically you're just clicking between the two when you want them. Something that seems really complicated. Like if I said, hey, we're going to do a shoot with two or three cameras, we need to switch between them as we go. You think, oh my gosh, like what must that workflow look like? Well, Final Cut, it's really, really easy. Yeah, I am. Um... In fact, I was going to ask you about that workflow in particular, because that's that's kind of on my list. Like, why not when I shoot studio video at home, set up an iPhone or maybe a, a Sony RZ1 that you're going to make me buy mm -hmm. <laughs> or set up, you know, a separate camera and just so I could have an off face camera, like one shooting at me from a different angle or whatever I'm working on and then be able to combine them. And um, so let's just, I want, why don't you tell me right now, how hard is that? What, what do you do to set that up? Yeah, so it's really, really pretty easy. So you bring in footage from both cameras and they can be different formats even. So if you recorded one on your phone and one on your Sony, it doesn't really matter. In Final Cut, you create what's called a multi-cam clip. So all you do is you select the clips. So you select, okay, this is my 20 minutes of camera A, my 20 minutes of camera B. You select them. You say, hey, this is a multi-cam clip. Final Cut then puts them together. They're still separate if you need them, but it creates a new clip with both cameras in it. And then you go in and set up uh, your... So the interface in Final Cut is completely like customizable. And one of the panels you can open is the multicam selector. 
And then you basically choose, I want this shot or this shot. And you can you can switch in between them. Now, the, the key for this is the syncing. And so like in those identifying by feel videos, I'm capturing audio. Like we both have microphones, but I'm also capturing audio with the cameras. And so Final Cut uses that audio to sync everything up. Uh, I will put a couple of links in the show notes like it, that really walk people through it. But that's really a, about all there is. You make sure that it has all the same audio so it can sync up and you tell Final Cut these go together and then you're just picking between them as you cut your project. Yeah, nice. Well, I think that one of the biggest barriers to Final Cut for me was the first run experience. And I think some, while I, I in general am very happy with how user-friendly Final Cut is, I think um, library maintenance and just like general setup is actually difficult to wrap your head around because they have all these different layers of projects. You know, when you set up a new project, with the, first they've got the library and then they've got the project and they've got the event and all of those could mean the same thing. And as a new user, it's not clear what it is you're doing there, right? So you could have a library with multiple events on it, and an event could have multiple projects inside of it. And then suddenly you get very confused if you don't know what you're doing. It is it is a little bit confusing. Uh, I, I would agree with you. That feels like sort of a old like a, a bastion of a time gone past. But yeah. once you get the hang of it, it's it's pretty quick. And there's a really big Final Cut community. So if you do run into issues, not only do you have Apple's resources, but you have folks like our friend Tyler Stallman who does videos on his YouTube channel about Final Cut Pro and things you should know. There's lots of great places you can learn much more about Final Cut, where if you run into a problem or, hey, I'd like to do this, how do I do it? The answer's out there. Uh, and, yeah. and and honestly, usually like the multicam thing I was intimidated by that the first time. I thought, gosh, this is going to be a real pain. It's like, oh, this is super easy. <laughs> and most of the yeah. time, that's what you'll find. Yeah. And, and what I resolved in doing is I just have really a library for me as a project. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to accumulate massive amounts of files on my drive for this stuff. Once I make one of these silly Disney videos, I don't feel a burning need to keep all this archival data of 4K raw pictures and all that. So I have, uh, I create a, a library for each project. You know, the May 4th thing was a library and the downtown Disney thing was a library. And then I set up in the project, uh, separate, um, little projects or events for the types of footage I captured, you know, the B roll, the Daisy talking, David talking, and I keep that kind of separated, but I've really also started to use the, um, the label, the tags, I forget what they call, they call tags, something else. Um, they have different tags. For it in front. Yeah. But, um, but I use those and it makes it really easy to jump between them. And uh, I did watch several Tyler Stallman videos this week and I wish I had watched them months ago. <laughs> He's so but good. We'll put some of his videos. He did a recent one that where he actually addressed that library question and he answered it the way I've, I've kind of evolved to do it. That made me feel good mm -hmm. uh, that he does it the same way. Yeah, yeah, that's how I do it. One video is one library, and that's it. I create a new library for everything. What do you do with all the data? I mean, because like you, it's, I'm sure you shoot a lot of like 4K video. It's all 4K. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I just go to my dr my drive right now, it's it's a lot of stuff. Uh, really, what I've come to do, uh, because because so, so to, to back up a second, Final Cut copies or you can set it up to copy it. So I have mine set up copies in your footage into this library file. And if you right click on it in finder, you can go through there and see what's there. Uh, but for me, it's become too much to keep. And so I keep, at least for a lot of my projects, I keep the final edited version and I may keep the B roll, but I don't necessarily keep the library forever with all the edits and everything. For me, it's just a man, a, you know, a space management thing. I mean, I've got, I'm coming up on a close to 90 videos on my YouTube channel and they're almost all 4K and it really adds up quickly. So for instance, the iMac M1 video that, that has gone up, 
as I'm speaking, I'm not quite done with it, but it's already 60 gigs worth of stuff. And once I add the final B-roll, it may be 80 or 90. And like that just very quickly <laughs> gets out of hand. Yeah. The other thing I learned is that um, that Final Cut creates its own cache file and it gets massive. Like a cache file for a single video project can get, turn into gigabytes. It's just, it's nuts how much it'll take as much space as your hard drive will give it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have come to the conclusion that I am not creating here like something that is for the ages. No. It's silly little videos my wife and I make together. And once I render the final video out, you know, maybe I'll wait a week and I'm going to just trash the whole library. I'm like, I'm yeah. done. And I don't even think, I know, I know the idea of B-roll, like, cause like I shoot B-roll of the carousel at Disneyland. Theoretically, I can use that in a future video. But one of my thoughts about, and I know this is a silly project for us, but one of my thoughts about people watching is a lot of people watch these videos, not because they want to hear me or Daisy talk. They just want to see Disneyland. You know, mm -hmm. you're in the middle of Kansas and you just want to see Disneyland. But I think you want to see current Disneyland. So me using year old B roll of the carousel doesn't make sense to me. So I think I'm just going to throw it all overboard and I'll yeah. keep the finalized video and that'll be that. And the cache files in there too. So I get rid of that massive cache file at the same time. Yeah. For a lot of my stuff, I still have the machines. And so if I need a random shot of a titanium power book and I don't yeah. have my original from three years ago, well, like yeah. I have it now that makes more sense yeah. and i don't want to necessarily repeat the same shot of that computer in multiple videos now if it's something that i'm filming that maybe isn't mine like i did this video on the stainless steel ipod shuffle and someone lent that to me for the video and so i kept all of that because there may be a point in the future where i want something and i don't have that on hand so i i kind of do it on a project by project basis I know some people archive everything and certainly I archive lots of other things, but the file sizes and especially with 4k is just, they get out of hand so quickly. It's just not feasible for me to keep all that stuff. And honestly, I don't go back to it that often anyways. Yeah. And I shoot, by the way, we didn't talk about that. I shoot for the YouTube stuff. Everything is 4k 24 frames per second. I don't know what have you decided on how you're going to shoot that stuff. Uh, I shoot 4k 30. Um, I, I, I get 24 and obviously it's like what movies and stuff are often in, but I think on YouTube 30 looks a little bit better. And so I, I work in 30 frames a second. And just for me, it's like, that's the minimum viable. And my camera is like, like that, that little uh, pocket camera can shoot 24 or 4k. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I made the choice. <laughs> the, uh, some tricks I learned using final cut that, um, I would recommend, um, is sort and favorite B roll. Like if you're going, even if you're doing a family video and you take some B roll, um, let's say you take your family on vacation to Disneyland and you shoot pictures of the castle or whatever, um, go through and favorite and cut the clips that you want to use as B roll at the beginning. And that way you can filter for that for favorites and it makes it so much easier. I try to do that manually. And then I actually got that tip from Tyler Stallman and it, it really helps. Another really good tip if you're working in Final Cut is the Ken Burns effect is very effective. And I don't think there's artificial intelligence involved, but it does a really good job of, of by default setting up Ken Burns photos. It's like if you're shooting family video and you want to add a picture of something and you want the picture to have some motion to it, all you have to do is hit the crop and then Ken Burns button. And then it automatically does it for you. But you can also change the way it looks if you want. And that gives motion to still images. I mean, I, do you do that very often in your video, Steve? And I think you usually use video for everything, don't you? Yeah, I try to use video for everything. But there are occasions where I need like an Apple Press photo. And so sometimes I'll add a little Ken Burns just to have some movement to it. But I try to, like if I'm, for instance, in this iMac video, there's some panning shots of, you know, from the side of the, the iMac. That's all video. That's not a photo that I've Ken Burns. But it is it is pretty nice. And again, it's something like, well, how would I set it where to start and where to end? Well, Final Cut makes it really easy because there's a green overlay and a red overlay. And you say green is the beginning and red's the end. And you say, I want this 
So I've got this photo. I want to start on the left side and I want to move to the right. You just arrange those boxes where you want them. It's not like you're, <laughs> it's not like programming keyframes or anything. You're just setting the start and end point and Final Cut just moves between them. I agree. And it's just really easy. And you can set the length just by dragging it. Final Cut is very forgiving when you make changes to your timeline, like it moves things for you or it'll insert it in between things. It just seems to know what I want to do with the way I drag a clip into the timeline. And I haven't really studied the nuances of this, but it, like I said, it, it's like whoever made this application obviously uses it a lot. And they, well, what would be the best behavior if he drags a piece of video and he holds it right between two other clips? Well, that probably means he wants me to move everything to the right and drop this in the middle. And that's what it does. It's assumptions about your intentions are almost always correct for me, too. I've always been impressed by that, a final cut. Again, something logic, it's quote unquote sibling, which is really made by like a very different group with an apple doesn't have any idea of, right? It's going to plop and override whatever you did, but Final Cut will move things out of the way and, and things will shuffle around for you. Yeah. And the other thing I like about it is like the really heavy pro tools in there um, all have a basic setting where you can just say, do stabilization or do color correction and do your best job. Assume that I'm an idiot. You're a pretty smart program. Do the best job you can with this. And for people like me, it does a really good job, you know? Um, stabilization is one that really stands out for me. I can't get over how impressive the stabilization tools are. Like when you shoot video and you're walking around at a birthday party, or if you're me and you're trying to be a, you know, wannabe YouTuber at Disneyland, everything's a little jiggly sometimes. It's hard not to, because you don't have like a steady cam or a big rig to put it on. Mm -hmm. But in Final Cut, there's a button that says stabilization and there's a dial. You can turn it up as much as you want or as little and it processes it right on chip. I, I, this may be an M1 thing, but that stabilization processing is so fast that it's like you don't even think about it. You just click the box and set the dial and it's yeah. done. That was one particular element of Final Cut that I noticed got much better when I went from an iMac Pro to a Mac Pro, where the stabilization happens really, really quickly. And like you said, most of the time, the defaults are good enough for what I'm doing, right? Like I don't know enough or really need to know enough to like get in there and, and fine tune and like do all these little knobs to all these certain little numbers. Final Cut's defaults are really good most of the time. And even things like basic color correction, which I know a little bit about and I do a touch in my videos, but for me, I can just make very simple adjustments. But then if you want to do completely like pro level changes, it's just available to you as well, all in the same program. Exactly. And like the B-roll stuff, which I think is something that is huge and everybody should be doing if you're shooting video, whether it's just for your family or for for uh, production and distribution. But having B-roll in your video makes it so much better. But a lot of us don't have like a glide rack or the, the fancy things that, you know, video professionals use to make really, you know, nice B-roll. Instead, we're just holding our camera next to our body and turning slowly and when you take that B-roll into Final Cut and you apply stabilization to it, it looks pretty damn close to the stuff people are getting with very fancy rigs, in my mind. Yeah, agreed. I mean, a lot of the, like, if you look at the May 4th video we did, there's a ton of B-roll in there. And I didn't have it on a trash can. I would just, you know, there was nothing there for me to use for most of it except me just holding the camera next to my body and moving slowly and mm -hmm. then going back and applying a stabilization. Now it does get a little smaller. So if you think you're going to be stabilizing later, shoot wider than you think you need. And then when you cut some stuff out, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to lose a little bit of the edges. Uh, the other thing you can do to make that a little bit easier is to shoot in a higher frame rate. A again, you may lose yeah. resolution. So you need to see what your particular camera does. But if you are going to edit in 30 FPS and you can shoot in 60, well, then you can slow it down by half and really help smooth things out that way as well. Yeah. With this camera that you're tempting me with, mm -hmm. what is the 4K high highest frame rate it gets? I don't know off the top of my head. I think 
I think it'll do 60, but I'm sure it won't go higher than that. Yeah, sure. The color correction stuff in Final Cut is another thing that I think is a massive improvement over iMovie. You press one button and it just makes things look a little nicer. I am just kind of shocked at how easy it has been for me to become a Final Cut user. I wish I had started this earlier. I mean, we've had guests on the show that talk about it, and but I just never really dug in deep enough. I, what you need, as always is the case, is a project. And now that we're doing this Disney thing, I have a project. Let's talk about audio for a minute in Final Cut. I think that's one uh, thing that's kind of fun. The uh, So like if you have B-roll, you can always remove the audio. There's literally a line with the attached waveform that just drags down. Um, by the way, one thing I do like about Final Cut over ScreenFlow is that Final Cut seems to 100% of the time accurately render the waveform for the audio. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that's so hard, but there's a lot of audio apps that don't reliably render that waveform. Hmm. And it's a huge problem for me, like with screen flow, because I code all my screen flow stuff. Like if I do, a, if I want to say the audio again, I'll click my tongue once and then I can see it in the waveform where I know where to make the edit. But if the waveform isn't reliably rendered, Sometimes Screenflow will just randomly put a waveform from a different clip under a clip. Oh, no. Yeah, it's not good, you know, but you can get it to, like, to get it to come back, you have to, like, delete the clip and then hit Command-Z after a few seconds and then it properly renders it. I don't really know. It must be a bug, but it's been there for years. And, you know, when you can't reliably trust that waveform, it makes the edit a lot harder because... Uh, with with uh, Final Cut, you literally just look in the timeline. You know exactly where the where the edit points are. But the other thing that's really cool is we've been doing music on the back of these videos. If you watch any of the the videos we shoot in Park, um, I get music, and then I wanted to do ducking in Final Cut. And the first video I did it manually, and ducking is the idea of like you don't want loud music and loud voices at the same time, right? And a lot of people don't get this right. If you watch um, a lot of more amateur video, they'll be talking, but they'll have music playing at full volume behind them. And then you're competing to try and hear their voice over the music. And it's really uh, difficult as a as someone consuming that. So ducking is the idea that you have music playing, but when you're talking, the music goes down. And the way I had done this, I mean, I'd used Final Cut in the past, but not not like I'm using it now. And the way I'd always done it before is you actually go on the timeline and you add markers and you manually set the markers. So, you know, the music allowed right up until you start talking, then it goes down and then it comes back up at the end. But they have this thing called the range tool. And I don't know when they added it, but it's like an alternate to the cursor and you just drag it in the timeline from, you know, before you start to before you end and you, you make one slider adjustment and it adds the ducking for you and does everything automatically. Ooh, It's like magic. That sounds way better than the way I've been doing it. So I'm going to check that oh, out. Oh, you got to find the range tool, man. Yeah. That's great. What are you yeah. using for that music? Cause you know, on YouTube, you got to be careful yeah, with careful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. copyrighted music. Yeah. I don't want to get in trouble. There's a bunch of different services out there. I ended up, I looked at a couple and I ended up subscribing to Epidemic Sound. Yeah, me too. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's 15 bucks a month for the license I need. I mean, we don't make any money off of this. It's just a fun thing, but I'm willing to spend 15 bucks a month to have good music in my videos. And what I like about it is you can search their library by mood. Like a lot of them, I just want like happy music. We're at Disneyland, right? And there's a ton of different options out there. They have some with vocals, some without. And um, they make it really easy. You actually give them your YouTube channel name when you sign up for it. So apparently they tell YouTube that stuff from our library is okay on this channel. I don't know, but I've never had a problem. No. I use it too. And one neat thing about it is you can download what they call stems. And so you can download the whole track or you could say, hey, I actually just want the instruments and the melody. I don't want the percussion. And it, depending on the yeah. song and genre, there are different types of stems. And so you yeah. get the track with just those parts of it. And so if you have a longer video and you want to use the same music, but sort of in different flavors, you can do that. Or if the you really like the track, but you think that the the bass is distracting, you can get all the other stems and line them all up and just 
don't have the the bass stem. And so that is a pretty cool feature of Epidemic Sound. And I think some other sites have similar things, but Epidemic makes it really easy. And yeah, it's what I've used for a couple of years now. And I just, I pay the subscription and I can use as much as I want. And it's all safe and sound with uh, YouTube's uh, copyright machine. I wish I had asked you because I spent a couple hours trying to figure out which one I wanted. I should have just sent you a message. Oh, well, now we've saved other people from it. There you go. Uh, overall, I, I'm enjoying this this process. And, you know, I always like learning new things with technology. And uh, it's been a, a fun for me. The learning curve is massively steep right now because there's new things to learn on each one. But even after just doing four or five of these, it's already turning into a process that that is like much faster for me. And once you learn, like for me, I'm not putting pretty simple videos together. And so I don't need a lot of the stuff in final cut, but as my needs grow, I can add one or two things to my tool belt as I go. And final cuts great for that, because if you don't need a certain tool or utility, you can basically just hide it. and <laughs> It's just gone, you know? Yeah. As a Mac power user, I want to start adding uh, keyboard shortcuts and you know more kind of automation friendly uh, stuff to the the application i'm not happy enough just to figure out how it's working and then just keep doing it you know with a lot of mouse clicks and stuff i want to make it faster and more you know like any app i use i want to make it just run quicker and and you know follow my thoughts as quickly as possible and i think i need to look into keyboard shortcuts and like keyboard mapping for the stuff I do, uh, Ripple deletes. We didn't mention that during the show, but I use them in ScreenFlow and I use them in Final Cut. And that's the idea that you you just you know delete a segment and then pull everything together. And in Final Cut, you do that with command brackets. That's the way. Actually, the way I've been doing it. At least I don't know how you do it. Oh uh, yeah, same same deal. And yeah, that's fantastic. So you don't have to move the rest of the timeline over. It just sort of closes up on its own. I know we've got listeners that are like super high end photographers and power users. In fact, I heard from a couple of them when I started doing this channel, uh, giving me advice. I don't think we gave them anything today. I want to give everybody <laughs> something every episode, but I also think that we've got a lot of listeners that haven't even got beyond dipping their toe with something like final cut. And I would recommend you look into it because never has the gear been less expensive to make really nice quality video. I mean, the led lights now you can get off of Amazon are like $60. Mm-hmm. You know, this camera that Steven's trying to talk me into is it's just expensive at six or $700. I don't know, but it's way less expensive than what a decent video camera used to cost by leaps and bounds. And, and even final cut. I mean, I think it used to be like thousands of dollars to buy the final cut software. And oh yeah. Now it's just a couple hundred dollars. So I, I, there's there's a lot of good reasons to try and play with this stuff if you're a nerd. And you don't even have to start with, like, with a camera. I mean, the iPhone yeah, the has iPhone, gotten to a point yeah. where you can shoot amazing looking and sounding stuff with just sort of a raw iPhone and bring it into Final Cut. And it does the HDR stuff that you need it to. And, you know, I like what these big cameras give me and the tools that I have, what I can do with them. but they're by no means necessary. In fact, the, I think two, and I have to go back and look, but I think two of the three of the Steven touches things playlist in my YouTube channel, I think two of the three were shot completely on iPhones and it looks fine. It looks great. You know, the only reason I'm not using an iPhone to do all of this is I really just want that fuzzy background. Yeah. And I want, a little i mean the iphone is a little noisy and it's a very small sensor and i think i'm willing to spend some money to uh to improve that but at some point if the iphone got good enough like if we had portrait mode in video that would be tempting like i looked into like some people are actually doing portrait mode in video by doing a screen recording on their iphone Mm -hmm. like you said it's a screen recording turn off all the UI stuff you can, and then you crop it just into the display as you are like setting up a shot and you treat that. But it's, it's, it's pretty hacky. And honestly, you know, portrait mode is not the same as an, as a 1.8 F stop lens. Yeah. (laughs) Phones have a ways to go before they get there. Yeah. But if it wasn't for that, I I feel like in general, I mean, it's a very stable video. 
and it's in your pocket already. That's pr- that's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Parallel from Relay FM. If you like this show, there's a good chance you're going to like Parallel. Accessibility in tech has come a long way in the past few years. Just look at what Apple announced as coming to the Apple Watch later this year with single hand control. Operating systems can speak, display high contrast text, and support alternative ways to touch the screen or move around it. But it's important to know if these efforts are any good, if they're actually useful to the people who need them. Parallel is a podcast on Relay FM hosted by journalist and accessibility expert Shelley Brisbane. She was just on MPU not that long ago. She describes it as a tech podcast with accessibility sprinkles. She and her guests put accessibility into the larger context. Sometimes it's about devices and software. Sometimes it's about living in a world that's powered by more tech every single day. So go check out Parallel. You can find it on the web at relay.fm slash parallel or search for Parallel wherever you get your shows. Well, thank you, Stephen, for giving me an intervention and helping me spend money giving me some tips. What are other things you would recommend to folks that want to get a little better at video? Yeah. Like I said, other than watching Tyler Stallman, I say, just, just watch <laughs> everything Tyler Stallman does. Uh, you know, I think the other thing too, that I've really, has really helped me over the years is really trying to understand like what you, like what you want to make. And so I really kind of had this thing when I started my YouTube channel I was like, I really want to sh- shoot and like make projects sort of in the style of someone like MKBHD. Now I'm not shooting on 8K Reds, but you know, I'm talking to yeah. camera. I have clever B roll, and it's sort of serious. Like he's talking to the camera, he's explaining things, and I still do a lot of videos like that. But I've also learned that I really kind of enjoy like this iMac video is weird and like probably not that helpful if you're trying to buy an iMac. But I was like, well, what if? Like, what if I do directly compare an orange iMac G3 to an orange M1 iMac? Like, and in the video, there's this joke on the scoreboard of like the comparison no one asked for, you know? So for me, it's, it's much more about making the things I want to make and then figuring the tools out to let me do that. And guys like Tyler Stallman, uh, I Justine has some final cut tutorial stuff on her channel. That's also really good. I think that's maybe where I saw the multicam thing the first time. I think she did that in a tutorial. I was like, Oh, uh, that's, that's cool. And sort of, you know, stick it in your back pocket. And when a project demands something, then you can, you can work on it. Yeah, no, it's fun. And like I said, anytime I get to learn something new about tech that pushes my buttons. So, uh, I'm really having a great time with it. I'm very curious to see what happens with this. You know, what kind of videos will I be able to make after doing this for six months or a year? Yeah. And this is a hobby project for me. I mean, I don't make any money for it. So it's like, we're just doing it in our off hours, but I mean, I would rather do something like this than watch a movie. So that's just my, you know, that's my thing, you know, so it's going to be really fun making them. And I, I do appreciate your help. Yeah. I, I'm enjoying watching them. You know, I'm one of those people who's like, I just want to see some Disneyland. Yeah. I mean, that that's kind of what motivated me was during the pandemic, we were watching a lot of those videos from people back when it was open and a lot of them, I felt like, were just goofy people that didn't really even understand Disneyland. You know, like they would say things that I just knew weren't true. And having worked there and Daisy worked there and gone, I felt like, well, we have something we could share. But I think the star of these videos really needs to be the park, not us. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of B-roll. Yeah. No, and it's cool because it gives you a real feel for it. And, you know, you can kind of picture yourself there. Yeah. That's the goal. Cool. Well, that about does it for video workflows. At least at this point, Stephen and I are still both works in progress on this. Mm-hmm. I want to thank our sponsors today, and that's our friends over at Smile and Memberful. Uh, we are the Mac Power Users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. If you are really into video, why don't you sound off in the uh, forums over at talk.macpowerusers.com. We'd love to hear from you. Tell me everything I'm doing wrong, gang. I'm sure there's a bunch. <laughs> I'm willing to learn, so so share it with us. And uh, we'll see you next time.